Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. We need each other. You know, we're stronger together than we are by ourselves. You know, people, I've seen it, you know, I've lived long enough to see this where some people make themselves an island. Okay, what do you mean? Like Gilligan, okay? Or like, like uh, the castaway or something, you know. They make themselves an island and, and there's, you know, there's always going to be you and God. But in life on this earth, you know, really the way God invented it is that we would draw strength from each other. Just like we draw from God. And we stand up with each other. And when, you know, crises come, don't wait for crises to have friends, you know. But, but you need friends. You need people that are con- you're connected to that will stand with you and, and get through, uh, you know, whatever comes on this earth, okay? Just a ramble, just a bit, just throwing it out there, okay? All right, we're in this series. We call it Down to Earth. And we've got a key scripture that we were inspired by. And it's in Matthew chapter 6 in in verse 10. And it says this, Jesus said this. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So i got to confess to you today. Okay, can I confess something? Okay, you all ready for this? You'll love me even after I confess it? All right, I'm going to preach someone else's sermon today. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm preaching Jesus' sermon today, okay? Because, see, you know, it's probably one of the most well-recorded sermons that Jesus preached is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, this week and even this morning, and I thought, wow, hey, woo, I'm out there, I'm preaching Jesus' message today. It must have been something good to say, you know? And here's one thing he said in this message that's found, you know, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, But he said this, he says, when you pray, pray this, that the will of God would be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. So I'm going to just point this out, this one thing, you know, we're calling this down to earth, and one point I'd want you to walk away with today is that God doesn't have one will in heaven and one will here on the earth. His will in heaven is the same as his will here on earth, and he doesn't want you to wait till you get to heaven to begin to enjoy his will for your life. You know, you know, sometimes, you know, we're human beings and we can have this tendency to put things off, to put enjoyment off. Just, well, I'll tell you, when I get to, when I get to the weekend, I am really going to enjoy life. Eh? Or, or, you know, when I go on vacation, am I really going to enjoy life? But here's the thing. If you wait till those times to enjoy life, you're going to find this, that when you get there, you're there too. I remember, I remember you know, a, a young guy, I was, I was going to Bible school, and, and I was going to Rama Bible Training Center, which is in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and Kenneth E. Hagen was the, the president of the school and the main teacher. And I, when I went to Bible school, I had read, you know, Brother Hagen had written many books, and I'd read every single one of them. And, and he was kind of my hero, you know what I mean? He's kind of my hero. And I was like fantasizing of what it would be like when I got down to this Bible school where this guy I've read all his books was at. And, you know, the guy knew Jesus, you know, he was just close, tight with him and everything. And that's what I found out is when I got there, it wasn't like I took my shoes off or anything, thank God. But, you know, it was 100 degrees out. But anyway, um, when I got there, there, was, there I was too. I brought me right along with me. And you know what? The way I did life back home would, ended up being how I did life there. So learn to do life here like as if you were there. You know? Jesus said, said my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me just give you a a, a real plain one right here. When we get to heaven, and heaven is a real place, you know, it's a real place. There's people in heaven right now. Jesus is in heaven right now. And and when, when we get to heaven, sickness is not going to be on the menu in heaven, okay? And the thing is, is right here on earth, God's will is the same as it is in heaven. 
Some people say, well, you know, I wish I knew what God's will was in this. I'm telling you what God's will is. Whatever you think is in heaven, I tell you, that's his will right here. Don't put off heaven living till you're in heaven, but begin to live on earth like it's on heaven, okay? You know, go through your day, man. It, does it seem like God would be far away when we're in heaven? I mean, when I think about heaven, that's something that just comes to the forefront of my mind is that I'll be hanging out, you know, with, with, with the Lord. You know, I'll just be hanging with him. It won't be a hard thing. He'll just be there. And you know what? That's what he wants to be in your life today. He wants to be so real that it's like you're walking down the golden streets and, and, and uh, swinging around on this crystal sea of glass. And, 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 you know, the angels are all around you going, holy, holy, not to saying that to you. They're saying it to, to, to God. And, 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 but, but you're in such an absolute awareness of his presence that you can hardly stand it. It's like, my goodness, you get goosebumps on your goosebumps. And, and your hair, if you have hair, it's standing straight up. And, and you're like, your eyeballs are big. And you're going, wow, 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 this is so cool. Well, hey, enjoy it now. Live like that now. Live like that. Begin to live like God's real. Begin to live like, like every day is an adventure with him. You know, well, but you don't understand what I got to do today. You know, I've got, I don't, I don't have churchy things to do today. That's where he shines the best. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, be real with you. I hear God so much better some days when I'm doing things that are totally unchurch related. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean I, I'm doing the, you know, sometimes I, I remember one time I went to this prayer meeting. Prayer meetings are cool, man. And I remember some guys in the church and me, we, years ago, we went down to uh, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And we were going to this, like, three-day prayer and fast meeting, you know. And anyway, I went down there thinking, man, God, I'm going to seek him. and He's going to speak to me. I'm going to just have direction for the rest of my life. Well, one, he never does that. But anyway, he just gives you the next step. But I was down there in what I would say is like a really, you know, holy atmosphere. All these guys were together. There's like 60 of us. And, you know, and Mark Brzee was leading it, and, and we were just praying and just seeking God and having a good time. We did take a break in the middle, and I went over to this one guy's house that I didn't even know, but he went to the church that we were at, and we played pool in his basement. That was really spiritual. That was cool. Praying and pool, get it? Two Ps, they go together. And so we were pl playing pool and praying. And, but, but, you know, the whole time I was there, it was, like, it was like if I heard anything from God, I don't know what it was. You know? I didn't hear anything except my stomach grumble. You know what I mean? But I'm telling you what, I drove, drove home and I started to hear him. Just me and him in the car, just driving away from that place, just being, being in, in a, a, you know, my own, do my own thing. God just spoke to me then. So, you know, don't try to think that, man, it's got to be this way for God to talk to me and, and, and that way or whatever. You know, usually it's when I'm minding my own business just walking around, usually, you know, praying before that or whatever. Who knows, whatever. Just, just being good, being, being normal. That God will just come and talk to you. He'll say things to you. He'll show you things you need to know. So the, the way you do life, a friend of mine said this once, and I'm going to repeat it. This wasn't Jesus. But he said, the way you do life is the way you'll do faith. Okay? You get that? Some people think about faith and they think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in faith. I'm going to walk in faith about, about this matter that I'm facing right now. But let me tell you something. The way you do life is the way you'll do faith. Okay? You see, if you reserve this faith walk as something special that you pull out in an emergency, it's not going to work for you. You're going to have faith failure okay that's why many people have missed it in what we'd call the faith life is because they've made it some big deal that it's not faith the way you do life is the way you do faith and the way you do faith is the way you're going to do you know well something like that but you got to do is, is you got to get used to it being a daily thing faith is a lifestyle where, where you get into trouble is, is when, you know, you think it's like this emergency kit, 
okay? And it's not an emergency kit. The way you do life is the way you do faith. And I'll say this, too. The way you do life is the way you'll pray, okay? All right? Or at least it is, it is how you should. What I mean by it is this, is, is, is prayer is just talking to God, is just connecting with him. Don't try to have this prayer voice. You know what I mean? Well, when you pray, you lower your voice a couple octaves, put a little reverb in it, you know? Oh, God. And he's, he's up there going, well, well, who's that? I don't recognize that voice. <laughs> the way you do life is the way you pray, okay? Uh, you know, I worked for Billy Graham for 10 years or so, maybe a little more. And a few times I'd go to his crusades, you know, and, and, and that's something that Mr. Graham would always say at the end of, of the night after thousands of people had come forward on the stadium fields to accept Christ. He'd say, I'm going to tell you four things. I can repeat them. I can even repeat some of his jokes. But anyway, he'd say, he'd say the same ones kind of usually. But anyway, four things he says. You know, one, he says, uh, if you've made Jesus your Lord tonight, he said, said, you know, he'd go tell somebody about it. He'd say this. He'd say, get into a good church. And he'd specify this, not just any church, but one that's teaching from the Bible. And he, then he'd say this, and he said, take time to read your Bible. He'd usually give, he, in fact, he would. He'd always give people Bibles. He'd mail them to them. And he'd tell you this, if you're a new believer, don't start reading in Genesis. And it seems right, don't you? You know, usually you start a book, you start in the beginning, you read Genesis on through. Well, Genesis is really super cool, and I love Genesis, but if you're a new believer, don't start there. Probably start maybe John. John would be a good place to start. Gospel of John. You're in the New Covenant, you know. Uh, I, I had somebody tell me in the last year, they're, they're just coming into these things, and they said, yeah, I started reading the Bible. I opened it up to Job. And, and, and the amazing thing, <laughs> can I just be real to tell you this? The amazing thing is this person said, you know, I was really getting some things out of it. And they shared what they were getting, and they were really pretty good. So it goes to show you, Holy Ghost is real. <laughs> Don't start in Leviticus either. Start in John. It would be a good place. It would be a good place. And then, then uh, what Mr. Graham would say then, the fourth thing he'd say is this. He says, take time every day and pray. And realizing that that is just such a, a big word, pray, he would qualify it. And he would say this. He'd say this. When you pray, just be you. Just be you. Talk to God like you're talking to your best friend. Just be you. He doesn't want you to talk in Christianese, and hopefully as a, as a new believer, you haven't even learned Christianese yet. And if you're an old believer like, like Dana and I, you got to watch yourself not to talk that way. Why is that? Because no one can understand you except another Christian. And you want to be able to pull people in that are on the outside. I, I, you know, I'm telling you. Did I tell you that all the time? It's because I'm telling myself that too. All right, so the way you do life is the way you pray. The way you do life is the way you'll connect with God. What am I saying? I'm saying this. It should be a daily thing. It should be a moment-by-moment -moment thing. I'm saying this is that, that don't just, just you hear the word just? Okay, don't just have a devotion in the morning Close the book and go on into your life, okay? No, have it be a moment-by-moment -moment thing that you walk with God. Have a life of expectancy of, men. what's going to happen next? You know, I don't know. It's going to be really cool, though. I believe it. It's going to be so good because I'm walking with God. He's real to me, and, and he's showing up in my life. I'm telling you, when things look like I should be freaking out, pulling my hair out, I can keep cool because God's with me. He's with me, and he's, he's a friend to me. I know his voice. I know his voice. You know, uh, I don't follow the voice of a stranger, but I, I follow him, the good shepherd, you know. He takes me where I need to go, takes me by, by still waters and green pastures and all that stuff. He does that because he's real to me. You know, that's how Dana and I live. That's how we live. God's real to me. I don't care where you are at. You know, you can be in the most remote part of Menominee or anywhere in the world. 
and, and God has your number. He, he'll look you up if you'll look to him. If you'll open the door, he'll come in and hang out with you. And, and you say, well, it isn't real to me. Well, do have time with him. The more you have time with him, the more real he gets to you. The more you recognize, I don't know if I recognize his voice. Well, if you listen long enough, the more you hear him, the more you will recognize his voice. You know, there's people in your life that, that man, they could talk to you and you just know right away it's them. This morning, uh, my youngest daughter called from Portland, you know. She calls when she takes the dog out for a walk. And, and so she called, and I, had, I didn't have the speaker on my phone. And, and I, I walked into the room where Dana was, and Dana says, who are you talking to? And I just turned the speaker on, and, and she could hear the voice. And she says, oh, well, of course. Of course it's Casey, you know. But why is that? I didn't, need, I didn't even need to introduce her. I didn't say, bum, 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 bum. Here's Casey. No, I didn't do that. All she had to hear is one one tone, and she's oh, it's Casey. Isn't that something? Just the tone, and you could tell it was Casey. You know, I had a friend. I do have a friend, a uh, friend I grew up with. I, I used to pick him up for school every day, walking to grade school. He'd make me almost late every day, and and uh, you know, we remain friends. You know, even to this day. You know, I had lunch with him about a month ago. Uh, but, but, you know, there was a season where there went about five years where I didn't talk to him. Wasn't mad at him. We were just both doing life and going different directions. And I, I, I remembered his, his home phone number. So, I, you know, isn't it something, if you think about it, you can remember kids, you know, friends, phone numbers from when you were a kid. But I couldn't tell you my phone number. But my friends could tell me my phone number. But I don't know my phone number, but I know their phone number. Because you didn't have speed dial. You always had to dial the number or, you know, that thing. And, and, and so anyway, I remember what five years went by, and I thought, well, I'll call his mom up and just see how I can get a hold of him. And I called up, and, and he answered the phone, and I was in shock. But I just said, hi, uh, you know, is John there? And, and he goes, yeah, what do you want, Paul? <laughs> before caller ID, this is way back ancient history, before caller ID was around. But he knew me because we'd spent time together. He knew my voice, even being surprised by my voice, he knew who I was. You know what? You can know God like that. You can know God like that. All right. Should we get into the message? <laughs> Matthew 6, 7. Um, you know, Pastor Stephen did a great job last week. If you haven't heard it, you should listen to it on YouTube or watch it on YouTube. Uh, Matthew 6, 7. I'm just kind of going down the progression of scriptures here of where we were, it says, Jesus said this, he says, when you pray, don't use vain repetition as the heathen do. They think they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So let me give you two concepts of prayer. One, when you pray, when you're asking God for things, there's, you know, there are different kinds of prayers. There's times I go to prayer, you know, and I'm asking him something, but there's times I just want to go hang out in his presence. You know, but when you're going to God asking him things, can I give you some advice? Really taken from Jesus, again, I'm preaching his sermon today, is don't try to pray long. Do you hear me? Don't try to pray long thinking that you're going to be heard for much speaking. In fact, instead of seeing how long you can pray, see how short you can pray. Usually when we make a prayer like that kind of a request kind of prayer too long, if we pray too long, we, we will eventually get into unbelief. If we pray too long, we'll eventually get into some kind of religion. If we pray too long, we'll get into this place where we think we're being heard because of some word, fancy words we're using. When you pray, just pray short. And, 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 and uh, you know, know that God hears you. Smith Wigglesworth is a, is a famous... Uh, preacher going back you know early 1900s and you know most people have heard of him he he was an English plumber got born again and and got on fire for God went around preaching actually had people raised from the dead in his ministry and and uh, he said this about prayer one time he said uh, you know I don't ever pray too long that's what he said this guy who knew God he says I don't usually pray too long uh, I don't pray over a half hour. He says this, but, but he said, I never go a half hour without praying. You get that? So what did he do? He made it part of his lifestyle. 
He made it part of his lifestyle that he, that he walked with God and was aware of him. You know, some of the greatest spiritual men I've, I've been around live like that. And I guess what I'm telling you and me today is we can live like this. That was one of the biggest things I noticed about the guy I talked about before, Kenneth E. Hagan. When I was down there at school, I mean, he was a good teacher, no doubt, and had some tremendous stories to tell and had been around ministry for, for decades and things that you could learn from him. But the thing I learned most from him wasn't the great teachings that he did, but watching him, I knew this, that he knew Jesus and that Jesus was real to him, you know, minute by minute. I'd even see him sometimes in the parking lot, and I could tell, you know, he was, he was talking to Jesus. Now, you know, be careful when you're in Walmart. Don't be walking around you know, on some cloud. They're calling for security. No. <laughs> anyway, you know, I tease that all the time, and I say, you know, don't, don't be weird in Walmart. And I remember one time I was in Walmart, and this guy uh, came up to me that had been to the church and, and uh, had this, this big need. And I found myself just praying really boldly right by the cashiers. And I said, in Jesus' name. And then all of a sudden I thought, Paul, Paul think about how you preach. You know? <laughs> I just, you know, be you. Be you. Don't try to be somebody you're not. Okay? The other thing that, that I get from what Jesus said here is, is don't beg and plead with God because he already knows the things you have need of. Okay? So, so, you know, prayer, you know, again, Jesus is, is giving us this Sermon on the Mount, and where I'm cracking into here is, is what he, we call the Lord's Prayer. In, in, in 6 9, he says this, in this manner, uh, pray. And he goes in, he goes, Our Father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name. Um, notice he said, In this manner, pray. And what he did not say is, Pray this prayer. Now, now, you may not know this about me, but I like to eat. And what you really probably don't know is that I actually enjoy cooking, okay? And Dana, you know, she nodded in the first service with her agreement. And you guys would probably know this too, that most meals at our house, most meals, not everyone, but most of them I make. Would you agree? Now, if you want a salad... Dana cannot be beat. She cuts the lettuce so fine. I love it. In fact, I tell her, make me a salad too, because if you're going to make one, no one makes it like you. I, what I love about a salad is when it's just chopped really fine, because I, I hate it when I take a bite of romaine and it slaps me in the ear or something. It's so big, you can't even get it in your mouth in three bites, you know. I don't like that. I like it to be easy. I just like to take it, you know. And, but most meals I make... And I, there's something about it I kind of enjoy, especially if there's meat involved. You know, I like to make it. But, but you know, I, 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 man, this even is next level. I even go out on the Internet and look for recipes. Okay? I do this. You know, and if somebody gets a good recipe, I, like to, I got a file on my computer, and I got a, a hard copy one at home, too, and I, I do go to it. And... and um, so, you know, a number of years ago, or a while back, I, who knows, time is so funny. Could have been five years, but it could have been a, a, a five months, I don't know. But I got this recipe online that has become one of our family favorites. And it's, it's these meatballs that, that you make the meatballs with some spaghetti sauce, and it's so dangerous to talk about this before lunch <laughs> in church. But, and then we make, we either make zucchini or we make spaghetti squash, and we put it all on it, and it's all veggies and protein, okay? And hardly, hardly any sugar, you know? Like, I think, whatever. Whatever's in the spaghetti sauce, which I always get the lowest kind of sugar in it. But anyway, so we make this stuff, and it's, these meatballs are so good, they're made with, like, Dijon mustard, and, and it's just, you know... I, I've made it so many times that I could probably recite the recipe right now. I could. I could. I, I, I come home sometimes from work, and I say, Dana, what do we want to eat? And, and we'll decide we're going to have this meal. I can have, it, I can have it done in a half hour by memory. So the kids were, you know, Pastor Stephen, Kara, they were in, uh, where did you guys go? China. They were, they were off on this trip a while back. You know, you guys remember when they were gone? 
and, and uh, they came back. And so I said, so guys, you know, you guys are going to come over. I think it was even on Sunday. And because and, that's kind of a tradition we have too. But uh, they're going to come over for dinner. I said, what do you want to eat? I mean, we could do whatever you want, you know. We'll get Ted's pizza. That's one of my favorites, you know. Or, or, or you know, what would you like? And they said, oh, oh, man, let's have that spaghetti and meatballs over the zucchini or whatever. And I said, cool, cool. I mean, it is good. It's a proven favorite. Nothing wrong with it. It's great. But how would it have been if they'd have come over to the house and I said, all right, everybody sit at the table, and I'd whip out a little card, or I'd just stand up, and I'd start reciting the recipe. Take a half a teaspoon of salt, followed by a half a teaspoon of pepper, a little bit of garlic, tomato paste, Dijon mustard, coconut flour, you know, whip it all up. What is that? Isn't this great, guys? Aren't you loving it? You see, Jesus didn't give us a recipe to memorize and recite. He gave us one to follow into his presence. Okay? And, and, and so, man, the content, the content, these guys connect, connect with heaven. Okay, so let me get down to it daily. This is the next thing he said. Give us this day our daily bread. Did you ever hear that before? Isn't that good? That's fresh, isn't it? All right, so there's the word that sta- so this just jumped at me, is daily, daily walk. You know, for the things of heaven to work in our life, we'll do good to practice them daily. To practice them daily. Not reserve God for church only, or not reserve God for, you know, that special conference that we're going to, you know. No, but experiencing him in our daily life. Now, in Numbers 21, there's a little story. I, I saw something in this this week. And, and um, where I'm going is, I'm not going to read it, but it's Numbers 21, 4 through 8. And it's a portion of scripture that I know I've used a number of times. And even in the last couple of weeks, I've read this portion of scripture to you. But, you know, it's like, like the word is like this, you know. You read these things over and over, and, and you see new things. You see new things. You know, I could sit here, I know, and preach last week's message. No, I couldn't, because Pastor Stephen did. I could preach the message from two weeks ago. It would be totally different than it was two weeks ago. And I would guess 99% of people wouldn't even know I preached the message I did two weeks ago. In fact, I preached the message 9 o'clock, and I preached it at 1030 they're never the same. It's a, it's a standard line with, with Pastor Stephen and I after church. Which service should we put on YouTube? One or two? You know, it's, it's out every week. It's like that. And sometimes it's one and sometimes it's two. People think you, you hear us talking about one and two. They think we're going to the bathroom or something. But <laughs> So Numbers 21, 4 through 8 is the story of the children of Israel. And they've come out of... Egypt, and they've, they're, they're going through the, the wilderness, and they're going on their way to what they called and we called the promised land. It's the land that, that God had, had, you know, told them that he was bringing them into, you know, and, and just to use words that they used, they, they, they described it as a land that flowed with milk and honey. Regardless of any term they used to describe it, we know this, God was taking them somewhere to fulfill a destiny. God was taking them somewhere with purpose. God was taking them somewhere that was going to blow their mind, okay? Nothing's different between them and us. So on their way to this place, you know, that, that God had for them, what are we talking about today? We're talking about daily. We're talking about not wait until we get to the place to experience God, not wait until we get to Friday to enjoy our life, but enjoying it right where we're at. So they're walking on their way to this place, and the Bible says this, that they became discouraged in the way. Now, there's many reasons you could, you could come up with for why did they get discouraged, but what I'd sum it up as this. Things probably were not happening in their mind as quickly as they thought they should. And so what did they do when they got discouraged on their way to this place? Actually, let me ask this question. 
If they're on their way to this place that God's called them to, were they in the will of God? You're not just in the will of God when you get to the place. You're in the will of God when you're on your way to that place. Okay? So, so, so they're on their way and they got discouraged. And the Bible says this clearly, that as they got discouraged, they began to complain about God and about Moses, their leader. They began to speak words of discouragement to God and to Moses. And I'll make this up. But this may be what they might have said. Where are you, God? Where are you? I don't sense you anywhere. Your hand isn't upon us. Where are you? We've obeyed you. We've done what you've said. We stood up to the Egyptians. We've marched out. We're going to the place you've called us to. Where are you? That, that could have been what they said. But we know the story unfolds this, that, that as this happened, you know, again, you read this, it says something like, you know, that, that it says, actually says God sent fiery serpents among them. And I, I always make this clarification that if you, uh, Robert, Robert Young was a Hebrew, noted Hebrew scholar, read this in his book called Hence the Bible Interpretation. He said that in, the, in the, the Hebrew language where it said that exact thing I just said, you know, that God sent fiery serpents among you, he said accurately read, it would read something like this, that God allowed fiery serpents on them. So what happened? They're walking through the wilderness, and again, probably the bigger miracle wasn't that fiery serpents came and bit them, but the bigger miracle was that, that up until that time, they're in the wilderness, and no one had been bit by a fiery serpent. But all of a sudden, they said, where are you, God? Where are you? We're, we're good people. We should, we should have you here. And when they did, they complained, and what happened is God's hand lifted from them. When God's hand really did lift from their life, what happened was the fiery serpents got in and started to bite. What are you saying, Pastor Paul? I'm saying that sometimes you're walking along in the plan of God. It seems so daily, seems so normal. Where are you, God? You know what? He's right there. His hand is upon you. He's keeping you from experiencing the dark side, and you don't even know it. Wow. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about acknowledging God, acknowledging Him. We're talking about walking with God, walking with God day by day. Genesis 5.23, there's a guy here that, that I think is one of, the, one of the coolest stories, man. This guy, you know, is one of them guys that when we get to heaven, you know, I'd like to talk to him. You know, and see what's going on with this, this guy. This guy is, is not always preached about, but his name was Enoch. And it doesn't even say a whole lot about Enoch. But what it does say is so powerful, and it's such a pattern to live by. He says this in Genesis 5.23. It says, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Wow. Wow. What, what was this? Enoch walked with God. God was so real to Enoch that he walked with God. And one day he was just so real, you know, that he wasn't anymore because God just took him. Wow. How does that figure out? That's like beam me up, Scotty. Okay? That's like, like, Enoch was there, and then he's, he's gone. He went, you know, what probably happened, I've heard it said like this, is that he got so close to God that it was closer to his place than it was to Enoch's place, so they said, oh, I'm going to go home with him. Wow. In Hebrews, it, there's another place that talks about Enoch. In he Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verse 5 and verse 6, it says that by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. But before he was taken, he had this testimony. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So what pleases God is you and I walking with him. 
What pleases God is you and I being aware of God. Verse 6, we don't always read these connected, but they're, they're in the same train of thought here, the same story being expressed. So it says that he, with, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then in verse 6 it says, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must, what? Believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what Enoch believed is that God is. God is real. I'm walking with him today. I'm not trying to find him. He's with me now. I'm walking with him. And as you get to know God on a daily basis like this, I'm telling you what, it will be evident to you that your father God is a rewarder of those that seek him. It'll be no question in your mind. Someone might come and try to tell you, well, you know, don't get too close to God. He'll make you sick for his glory. You'll just stand there cool and you'll go, what? You don't know my God. You don't know him. I walk with him every day. He would never do that. I know him. I know his voice. When he calls me, I listen. I'm in tune with him. Now, it says that for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, where do we even start with this? How do we believe that he is? And I'm going to wrap it up with this. How do we believe that he is? Well, I'll tell you this. Begin by just acknowledging his hand upon your life every day. Begin by just acknowledging him, making him bigger in your thinking than anything else you're facing today, okay? Begin by acknowledging it. Well, I don't know what to acknowledge. I look out my window, you know, like eating breakfast this morning or drinking coffee, to be honest. Looking out my window, eating, drinking coffee this morning, and I just look at, at the birds. The birds were in our yard. They're over on this place where we have like a hummingbird feeder and a bird bath, and they were just just you know, playing in the water, and, 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 and then they'd go up and they'd suck some juice. I don't know what kind of birds they were, but they liked that hummingbird stuff. And they were up there just drinking that and playing in the water, and I thought, wow, God made these things. God made them. What is that? That's acknowledging him. I sit, sometimes I sit and watch, you know, I look at, I, I've planted these seeds in the ground, you know, uh, out, out in a flower garden that we have. And it's amazing. I go out every day and I water them. And it's like life is happening from these seeds that I planted. And I go out and I water them in the morning. And I go, wow, God's making this happen. That's just an elementary level to step in and say, God's real. He is. And he is a rewarder of my life because I'm seeking him. And then you go, go along in your day. And, and, you know, it's like I was talking to Dana the other day. It's like, so we're so used to walking with God and just having him do stuff in our life that it's almost like i got to stop and say, yeah, that is God doing this in our life. You know what I mean? I mean, this is how we live all the time. And it's like i got to go, wow, you know, this is not the norm. You know, can I tell you one? We were watching this show. Actually, the show is called Alone. One time I preached a, a, a message on, on never alone, and I took it off that show. And the pre premise of alone is they take these people and they drop them over in uh, Vancouver Island or someplace remote where they have no contact with human beings at all, and it's a survival thing. I know, it's really weird, but I get into this. And we were watching this guy last week, and, and he, uh, he, you know, he, they've got a, uh, one of them recorders on themselves, so they film what they're doing. And he was walking along, and he got his foot caught in something. He, he twisted his ankle. And just hearing the progression of thought that this guy displayed and expressed into the camera, I said to Dana, man, that guy's going to tap out any minute. But it was just like, he, first he got his foot in there. The next thing, he started expecting it to go worse and bad. And, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay here any longer. Oh, it's, uh, beep. helicopters are coming. They're taking them out. They're evacuating them. And there it goes. And just not too long ago, Dana had a, a, a thing happen where she was doing the laundry. And she was walking down the stairs of our house because the laundry is in the basement. And she gets down to the last couple stairs and she tripped and fell. And, and she twisted her ankle. And here was the thought she had. 
she thought, she, she went down and she got up and she said, I'm not having this. And she just took her stuff and got up and walked away and it never, it never manifested beyond that. And, you know, that's just everyday living. But we have to say, oh, that's God's hand on my life. I acknowledge him. He's my protector. He's my healer. Even when it looks like I'm falling, he's the one that picks me up. A righteous man might fall seven times, but the Lord will raise him up. Acknowledging God. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. He'll give you life. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.